So unfortunately, <laughs> if I am gathering correctly, if I'm just, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I own a five unit rental property in Pasadena. It's in our family trust. Technically we can apply for the EIDL, but we haven't seen anyone get these monies. So far I have not seen anybody get these monies. That's correct. Unfortunately. So best we can tell landlords is, uh, looks like no one may be coming to help them and they're going to have to bootstrap through these times, uh, if tenants don't pay and you can't evict, essentially there's, there's no financial um, help for them at this point. Hi, this is Chris German from the apartment dealer. Welcome back to the apartment dealer show. This is where we bring you the resources, strategies, and the network of professionals that can assist you as you build your financial legacy through investing in multifamily properties. With me today is Mr. Stephen Hall. Steve now for over two decades has been an enrolled agent working with those individuals through the tax process, whether they be investors of multifamily and landlords like you, to individuals of high net worth, to even individuals in entertainment and uh, just really across the whole spectrum. That's why we like to have uh, Steve with us. And even more importantly, Steve is a investor of real estate himself. So he is able to share with you what's practical. As a landlord, what can you practically do as opposed to what does the textbook say? And so Steve, thank you for being with us today. Oh, you're welcome, Chris. Thank you for having me. And I, I mean, I really have to toot your horn here for a moment because you, you know, I want people to understand that your, the depth of your knowledge goes well beyond just the tax code. You're involved in uh, business startups, you help people establish different business entities. And when we say work with people of significant, uh, significant net worth, I mean, you're working with some high powered individuals. And so you, you have that, you know, that experience, that knowledge. And uh, I know we were together uh, about a month ago for our live webinar. And because there's been so many changes, especially with the CARES Act and the different loans that are being provided by the government, we wanted to sit together again. But before we dive in, I trust you and your family are doing well in this uh, pseudo quarantine. Yes, Chris, and my kids are loving the quarantine. They, 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 find, they gave themselves an excuse to game all the time. And I'm sure all of you that are listening to this webinar will agree. It's hard to uh, be a parent these days when your kids are, uh, are uh, quarantined in the house and they want to get out there and run. So I'm sure we can all relate as parents trying to uh, give our kids enough activity to, to stay busy. Sure. And, and, you know, of course, many have said with this quarantine, it's brought um, some blessings with it. I'm sure you're getting more time with the family. I'm getting more time with uh, my family. You're not stuck in the office for long hours. There is some blessings, but there's plenty of negatives. And that's what we want to draw our attention to. Um, we received a lot of questions from landlords. And so let's start with really the obvious. Uh, the Government, both the governor, local municipalities have given cover fire to tenants essentially where they don't have to pay rent and they cannot be evicted on top of it. And interestingly enough, the loss of rents is not covered in one's insurance policy. So from a tax perspective, whether they own you know, any type of commercial property, how are you ad addressing this issue with your clients? Good question. There's been a lot of changes the last couple of days. Uh, for example, the PPP loan, the Paycheck Protection Program, is, is banning folks that are property managers that own up their own apartment buildings or folks that are involved in uh, developing real estate from benefiting from the PPP loans. So that's, that's a new update that we can talk about in a little bit. And also uh, just, just the overall climate with landlords and their protections that we used to be given. And the, notice I used the word past tense, used to be given. Well, I understand, Chris, did the, so did the city of LA pass a moratorium to, uh, to abate evictions until the end of the year? Yeah, so they, well, essentially they said tenants have up to 12 months to pay back due rent. And then the judicial council, essentially all the courtrooms said, they will not hear or issue a summons for an eviction case for 90 days after the governor lifts the stay at home order. So we had Dennis Block a few days ago where he basically did the math where it could be up to a year that landlords could go without 
income. And so really year. up to one year, if, if, if the tenants know how to uh, game the system. So April went fairly well for most people. Everyone's holding their breath for May and June because tenants were uh, out of work, have, would have been out of work longer. And or if you're a commercial property owner, retail, a lot of shops had it, were given the order to close. Uh, are you involved in any of those discussions with your clients and tenants not paying rent? Yes, I have one client where in, in LA, the tenants are, are going on a tenant strike, literally. So the whole building is deciding not to pay rent. And uh, they're, they're currently working with the banks to uh, do a workout with the with that specific property, the lender. And the lender, fortunately, is cooperating and understands the situation. So they're being sympathetic to the, to the environment. But uh, some of the us landlords won't be so lucky on the next building. So the, the, you hit the nail on the head. The question is, what will the tenants do and what rights do they think they have if they find out about these rules as far as uh, where they won't get evicted for up to a year? It's going to be an interesting balance of, of how to communicate and treat your tenants versus the tenants just saying, I'm just not going to pay. And uh, I'm speechless. I feel right now just talking about it, but what I just said, I would have never thought in a million years I would be saying this, that the tenants, the landlord, unfortunately, is in the middle where they're sandwiched, where you have the tenant on one side and you have the banks on the other side. And depending upon the loan covenants and the uh the tenants could do whatever they want for up to a year, but the lenders, if after a 90 day forbearance, still want to get paid. And it's going to be an interesting scenario of what the landlord can do if, if they have cash flow issues, et cetera, to, to work around their, their turn around their asset. So let's talk about forbearance. Obviously there's some math that one has to look at. Is it wise to, because uh, there's, there's a cost associated with that, with, you know, uh, the additional interest and what have you. So as one in general, I know it's case by case, but in general, if a client is contemplating utilizing the forbearance that the lender is offering and or going a step further and even are looking at a bankruptcy, what are some general things to consider in either circumstance? So I had a call with the uh, bankruptcy council uh, earlier for the that the work with a lot of our clients. Does Steven Spearier practice bankruptcy, Chris? I do not know. Okay, so if Steven does not, I have a bankruptcy attorney I work with closely for real estate matters. And he stipulated under the CARES Act, small business owners have up to a seven and a half million dollar loan balance that they could go bank through a reorganization. And the reorganization just simply means that you're telling the creditors that they need to uh, restructure the payment plans. And that's called a Chapter 11 bankruptcy. However, the CARES Act provisions do not include single tenant real estate. So the single tenant real estate actions would still have to go through the, the, the traditional Chapter 11 reorganization bankruptcy. So if it's a large building, it may be worth your while to do it. But if it's a smaller building, we have to weigh the pros and cons with the attorney. The, the typical legal bills to restructure a Chapter 11 bankruptcy is between two hundred dollars to $300,000. So you have to weigh in. Are you going to make more than 300000 on the transaction? Or, or the restructuring the debt worth, uh, as far as the payments, will you save more than 300000 worth of cash flow over a period of time? So... So what, what is going to be important for those of you that are not sure what's going to happen with your cash flow to consult a bankruptcy attorney to, to conduct a pre-bankruptcy consultation, I guess the best way to describe it, to plan so that we can figure out what phase one would be, whether it would be a forbearance, phase two to do a, your own workout with the bank, or phase three, file a chapter 11 bankruptcy to reorganize your creditors and your payment plan with your creditors. So for those individuals who uh, had, were already in a sales transaction and they don't necessarily like the climate they're in now, but they must go through a 1031 exchange to avoid capital gains tax, uh, are there any new uh, leniencies given by the government in terms of timeframes of which to uh, complete the 1031 exchange? Yes. Yeah, so I was working with the head of our National Associate of Enrolled Agents Lobby with the IRS to extend the identification period. 
And as a result of those conversations, I can't confirm it came from just directly us, but a group of us from the industry, the 45 day extension period through a revenue procedure that was published earlier last week is now July 15. So if anybody has an exchange going on right now, you have till July 15 to identify your property. Now don't take my word for it on this webinar, consult your tax advisor or through later on in this webinar, we'll text you some information to text us your specific situation. So, but for generalities purposes, if you fit the specific timelines that we'll give you later on, your 45 day uh, identification period has now been extended to July 15 of 2020. So what we see up front from that, if I understand correctly, is you can't start a sale today. Today is April 23rd. Your sale must have already been in the process in order to take advantage of the extended timeframes. Am I, am I correct in that understanding? Correct. That's correct. Okay. Now, one question that I received uh, several times now, especially over the last week, is, hey, my stocks have taken a beating. I'm considering cashing out, moving that money to real estate. Uh, how does that transition work in terms of taxes? If I sell my Google stock, uh, obviously no taxes have been paid on that gain, if they still have gain, and I move it right into real estate, at what point is the gain paid on the stocks? Is it wise to do so? Is there a vehicle that they should look at to make that come to pass? Good question, Chris. There's a new vehicle called the Opportunity Zone that came out about 24 months ago. And what it is, is when you sell your stock, let's say you sold Apple and you're making 100,000 in profit, through an Opportunity Zone investment, you can reinvest those $100,000 for the gains into real estate. But the caveat is you have to invest in what's called a Opportunity Zone area and follow the Opportunity Zone rules. So for example, if you were to buy, buy a piece of property by USC, some land, and you were to build on the land in an apartment building, that could potentially qualify for an Opportunity Zone uh, program but you have to satisfy those regulations within a certain amount of time. So the, the, the question really is in this environment, is it worth cashing on stock and investing in an opportunity zone? Maybe if you are creating your own opportunity zone environment, but if you're going to cash out an Apple stock and go into an opportunity zone fund, that's another question because what I would wanna look at is the opportunity zones track record and see where they are going from a cash flow perspective in this environment versus what they were proposing to do two years ago when they first opened their opportunity zone fund. Just two years ago, the climate of, of, of the economy was very different than what it is today. And so the climate of the economy today, obviously there's been a massive amount of quantitative easing. Uh, many people don't realize that even as of October of last year, though, the government had already started a quantitative easing program. That was around the time we did our last uh, live educational luncheon and the government had injected a bunch of cash because essentially uh, the banks had a liquidity problem even at that time. But of course, over the past, this past month, they've injected trillions of dollars into the economy what does that mean to the layperson? Obviously, the money doesn't just fall from the heavens. I mean, they turn on the printers, they print the money, and then carry us through that process. What's the long-term effect of what they've done? Those are good questions, Chris. In fact, right now, the House of uh, Representatives just passed a $484 billion relief package to deal with. This is the fourth coronavirus relief bill in less than eight weeks. Just to give us give everybody an idea, um, I I don't know the exact number, but I believe it's over three trillion dollars has now been been uh, deployed to help the U.S. economy through this pandemic. What does that mean? What's happening is through time, when you print money like this, you you create a, a slang term called banana republic, where you're printing so much money that the economies so, so supposedly fall off the rails to where there's runaway inflation. For example, in Germany prior to World War II, the Germans had such runaway inflation that one day your milk 
will cost a dollar, the next day will cost ten dollars because there was so much money that was being printed. Now, when you look at previous economies such as uh, Mexican Mexico's economy, Argentinian economy, or the South Korean economy, they have gone. They have experienced bouts of this. And what happened in these economies is they all had devaluations on their currency, where one day their dollar bought them uh, one, one gallon of milk. The next day, that dollar caught, caught, would, would give them a quarter of milk. So we could see the same process happen to the United States. Now, the good news for all of you landlords is this. So no matter what happened in South Korea, Argentina, or Mexico during these times of uh, hyper printing of money and inflationary environments, the landlords always worked it out and they were always able to long-term keep their properties and to manage their cash flow. For the short term, it's a storm to ride through. And why is it stormy? Because for example, earlier in this webinar, Chris just talked about local legislation where legislators are giving tenants rights to stay in a property while the landlord has to weather the storm and keep that tenant occupying that building for zero consideration of dollars and cents coming into that checking account. But long term, that building should go up in value. Because when you adjust the value of real estate with inflation, for the most part with the South Korean economy, the Mexican economy, or the Argentinian economy, they most of the time recover from these turbulent environments. There's a fourth economy that we will probably model after, and that's Japan. In Japan, in the mid-90s, they went through a massive correction that we're experiencing right now, and the Bank of Japan decided to print their money. And the problem is they could not print their way out of a deflationary environment, and to this day, they still have deflation. However, there's a saving grace with all of this. The problem with the Japanese economy is that the average family had less than one child. So some families had one child, some families had zero children. And so over time, when you're wanting to grow your economy, the only way to grow it in, in the eyes of the Japanese economer, economists was to print more money. Whereas the real underlying factor to grow any economy is birth rates. If you look at a great author named John Burns, he wrote a great book called The Great Shift Ahead. It's a great book for all of you to buy it basically talks about how our 80 million millennials right now that are in their 20s, early 20s, mid 20s, are gonna start having families and have babies. And when they start having families and have babies, that should propel our way out of this deflationary environment. The big question is gonna be, how long will it take for us to work our way out of this deflationary environment? That's the big unknown. So long-term landlords are gonna be fine, and we will be able to, to uh, have babies to work our way out of this problem because there are two saving graces in this country. One is the Hispanic market where the Hispanic families, the average Hispanic family has three to four kids and the millennials because there's 80 million millennials and the millennials are 10 million larger of a demographic than the baby boomers, I believe. I, I could be off by a few million, but I know the millennials are a larger demographic than the baby boomers and that's why in the 40s, they called the baby boomers the baby boomers, right? Because there was a baby boom right after World War II. Uh, all the GI soldiers came back, and they started having families. And that's what boomed our economy through the, through the prosperous decades we've had the last four decades. And we should continue to see such a boom the next couple of years when these millennials and Hispanics start having more children. But we, are, we have a gap, and that's a 24 to 48-month gap. And so the question is, how long will it take for us to close that gap so that way we minimize this, this uh, unfortunate set of circumstances of a deflationary environment? So, yeah, and it's been interesting times. I mean, just prior to the recording of our webinar here, uh, oil went to zero. Yeah. And again, things have been topsy-turvy. It's too early to tell, uh, you know, where things will be a month from now even because things have been changing so rapidly. But at least one thing we know that's in place is the CARES Act. And many landlords are curious as to, is there any money available to landlords to help them through this time if and when tenants don't pay and they still have to make the mortgage and so forth. So can you share with us the information you have on the CARES Act and how that addresses uh, specifically our audience, the landlords? Yes, Chris. 
So we have here, first of all, let's talk about the CARES Act overview. Congress started legislating this shortly after this pandemic was announced and they passed this about three weeks ago. Since this has been passed, as what Chris and I just discussed, they have already amended the bill and, and, and created four relief programs since then. And the fourth one has just passed the House of Representatives today, the 23rd of April. So already within three to four weeks and eight, less than eight weeks time, we've had four stimulus packages uh, helicoptering money into the economy. So let's dive into what this means for you, you all as landlords. So to give you a background, Robert Hall and Associates have been through four, four different recessionary cycles. We've been in business for over four decades. So we have experience helping the business owner and the landlord on how to structure their business to, to survive such turbulent times. And we practice tax accounting, as Chris said earlier, so we could help you with your limited liability company filings, your rental property filings, and your business filings, as well as your personal tax filings. The first stimulus that we want to talk about that you, we, have all, we have all seen headlines on, it's a stimulus check. Most of your tenants will qualify for the $75,000 per person stimulus. And it is $1,200 per person in your household that will qualify for this that are adults. So if your husband and wife, you'll qualify for $2,400 plus their children. So if you have two children under the age of 17, they will earn $500 each. So if you're a family of four with two young children, you will receive $3,400. But what we're really saying here is that your tenants will receive $3,400 if you have a family of four living in a two bedroom, two bath apartment. And that's important for you to know that they are going to be receiving some cash flow. And this link to the right of your screen, you'll see a Washington Post link. That is a great calculator for you to work with to calculate to see how much you would qualify for your stimulus. So if you have questions about stimulus or what to communicate, you can always text us to 38470. Type in the tax RHA and at the bottom of the comment section after you complete your name and uh, contact information, you can plug in stimulus questions and one of our team members will be able to assist you from our office to answer your specific stimulus related questions. So if you're a real estate agent and you don't have a corporation, you will qualify for the payment, the paycheck protection program. So what we've learned the last couple of days through this program is banks like larger banks, such as Wells Fargo and Chase Bank has already run out of money for this program. So you have to contact a, a local community bank to be able to assist you. And the form that works as follows, if you made $100,000 last year in profit, they will average that $100,000 over 12 months, which will be $8,333 a month and they'll pay you up to two and a half times those funds to your checking account. So hypothetically, let's say you made 8,000 a month as a net income, the government will give you $20,000 in that example, two and a half times that 8,000 to help you through this pandemic. Now on top of that, the government will forgive that $20,000 if you use that money to pay yourself. And above and beyond the 20,000 you may qualify for is two and a half times your, your health insurance, as well as two and a half times your retirement benefits that you pay yourself, such as funding a retirement account. For example, if you fund $12,000 a year to a retirement account, you will qualify for a $2,500 retirement funding program. The time frame to cover for this PPP loan it's going to be February 15 of 2020 to May the 30th of 2020. So as long as you pay yourself back those funds during this time frame, you will qualify for a forgiveness program. And the loan is typically forgiven as long as you pay yourself back. And then whatever is not paid back will have to be converted to a loan at 4% interest over a 24 month period. But if you do structure it properly and pay yourself the loan back, the loan will not be taxable to you as basically free money to you as the taxpayer. So if you have any questions or if you need a bank to help you with this, text 38470 and text the code RHA. And at the bottom of the comments, after you complete your personal information, put in, you need information about the PPP loan. 
The second, third stimulus that Congress has legislated is called the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. So far, we have not been seeing our folks receive this loan. So in this example, the PPP loan are receiving funds for the EIDL. The grants covers paid leave, maintaining payroll, rent payments and mortgage payments, repaying debt obligations, et cetera. And if not forgiven, this 30 year loan is capped at 3.75%. Now loans can be up to $2 million for the first $200,000 with no loan guarantee. And they're approved based on your credit score and there's no collateral required. The government says they'll pay it within three days of applying online. So far we have not seen the government paying these loans yet. And I don't know if it's because of the sheer volume they're receiving, for example, these loans are very popular for tornado ridden areas or hurricane regions where only maybe 10,000 people are applying at once. And in this case, when you have the whole United States as a whole apply, they're probably getting a million applications a day versus 10,000 a day. And their system's just overrun with the sheer volume that they're processing. So that could be the reason why we're not seeing any response so far from this EIDL loan. If you have any questions about this loan, again, you can text us at 38470, put in the code RHA, and just simply at the bottom of the comments after you plug in your personal information, plug in questions about EIDL loans. Now, can you apply for both? The answer is yes. You can apply for the EIDL $10,000 grant, which will simply reduce the amount of funding you get from the PPP program by $10,000. Now, if you have a corporation, what can you do? For those of you that own a corporation, you can still apply for the PPP loan as a real estate agent, but if you're a property manager that's managing property that you own, you will not qualify for the loan. We just found this out this afternoon. Uh, those are some of the guidelines for the PPP loan that they does not qualify for PPP. As far as the EIDL loan, you will qualify for financing as a corporation. And last but not least, unemployment. The state of California under the CARES Act is gonna be subsidized by the federal government to support all self-employed individuals that are experiencing economic hardship as a result of the pandemic. So as a result, the employees of these corporations can apply for unemployment starting April the 28th. The EDD is opening up, I'm looking at my calendar right now here at the EDD next Tuesday is opening up a portal for the self-employed individual that have their own company or are sole proprietors to be able to apply for unemployment benefits as of April the 28th. There's been a lot of confusion in this area. I'm sure some of you have already tried to go on the EDD site to apply for unemployment, per that's what the government was uh, communicating to the public. The EDD simply was not ready or equipped to handle self-employed insurance claims. So they had to build a new portal and that portal will be ready next Tuesday, the 28th of April. Now, can you apply, let's say you, you, one of you have multiple LLCs, multiple corporations, can you apply for multiple entities? The answer is yes, you can apply for the emergency injury uh, economic loan per entity. You can apply for each tax ID number. And the PPP loan is, is capped at $10 million worth of total funding across all your entities. So you do qualify for those loan programs. If you have any questions about what was, we just talked about, specifically to the EDD unemployment, or if you need help on that, or the PPP loan for multiple entities, or the economic injury disaster loan, you can text RHA at this 38470 number and just put in the comments the PPP loan, EIDL loan, or the EDD unemployment uh, application. That will be available the 28th of April. Now, if you have rental properties, can you apply? The answer is yes, through the EIDL program. But like Chris and I have discussed a little while ago, we have not seen the government fund those grants at the moment. And as far as the PPP loan, we were just told that they do not qualify for this program as a landlord. And we're waiting for more information. And during this webinar, I just got a call from one of the banks. So at the end of this webinar, I'll be able to update everybody here when I get some additional information on how this will impact those of you that need some relief through the PPP program, but our landlords.
if you have LLCs, what can you do? So as discussed earlier in this presentation, you can apply for the EIDL loan to and tie each grant to every federal ID number that you have. And uh, if you need help, what should you do? You could always complete our uh, second opinion program that uh, is right here online. You can simply text 38470 and text RHA inside that uh, text bubble. And then put under the comments, just stipulate what you're looking for and we'll be able to, to help you. Now I'd like to turn this back over to Chris. And Chris, I understand you have a few more questions about the, the stimulus and what, what can be done for our landlord community. So unfortunately, if I am gathering correctly, if I'm just, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, I own a five unit rental property in Pasadena. It's in our family trust. Technically we can apply for the EIDL, but we haven't seen anyone get these monies. So far I have not seen anybody get these monies because that's correct, unfortunately. So best we can tell landlords is, uh, looks like no one may be coming to help them and they're gonna to have to bootstrap through these times uh, if tenants don't pay and you can't evict. Essentially, there's, there's no financial um, help for them at this point. That's a very harsh way of saying it, but yes, that's not the unfortunate <laughs> situation right now. And it's unfortunately, I'm smiling about it, but it's not a funny matter. I mean, it's a very serious issue, but uh, I continue to search every day for some programs or to at least let the decision makers of Washington know that the landlord is an important community to be heard. Um, and we need to have a voice to, uh, to make some amendments to the current programs. So that way we can grant relief to the landlords that are experiencing hardship at this point in time. So let's say, okay, I'm a landlord and you know, I have uh, some of my tenants are not paying. I'm getting hurt there. I'm looking at my stock portfolio. I've been hurt there. At our live webinar we did a month ago, you mentioned something to the effect that if you had losses to convert their IRAs, can you expand on what one should do at this point if they have a SEP IRA, Roth IRA, so forth? Yes, thanks for reminding me, Chris. So if there are, if you, this, there's a very important piece of legislation that has been passed that I did not think would be important, but until I've seen the severity of what we're seeing today, especially with the legislation of the city of LA legislating to grant tenants relief from not paying their rent for up to a year. There's a provision called the net operating loss provision. And what that means is if you as a landlord experienced substantial losses in 2020, we're going to be able to book that loss on your tax return and go backwards five years with the loss you have in 2020 and go back to 2015 and file an amended tax return to claim a refund for all the taxes you paid in 2015. So I'll give you an example. Let's say in 2020, you lose $100,000 and you have a loss of $100,000 on your tax return in 2020. We can go back to 2015 and apply that $100,000 against your 2015 taxable income. So let's say your taxable income for 2015 is $115,000. After we amend the return to show the, the $100,000 loss against your $115,000 in taxable income, you're gonna have a taxable income of only $15,000. So therefore, let's say your tax rate is 20% on that $100,000, government will issue you a $20,000 refund check in that kind of a scenario, potentially. So, now let's say, let's use a different example. Let's say you have a $100,000 loss in 2020, and let's say your taxable income in 2015 is only $50,000. The government will take your tax liability for 2015 down to zero, and then the remaining 50,000 that was not used will be able to apply for the 2016 year. So we can go forward from 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, all the way through those years to use up all those losses you may be experiencing in 2020 to go backwards to capture those refunds for you. But I'm hoping we don't have that kind of a conversation. I'm hoping we turn things around quickly and we don't have losses for 2020. And then again, specific to the uh, SEP IRA, Roth IRA, is there some type of conversion individuals can utilize uh, if they've had significant losses in their stock portfolio? 
Yeah, so for so another way to look at this, if you have a large loss in your in your retirement account and you have a loss, a hundred thousand dollar loss this year from your apartment complex, it may be a good year to to analyze your retirement account and convert your retirement account to a Roth IRA. And the question is, what is a Roth IRA? A Roth IRA is a vehicle that can grow tax free. And as long as you keep the funds in your Roth IRA for up to five years. After the fifth year, you'll be able to pull funds out of your Roth IRA tax-free. Whereas if you keep your money in your retirement account now as an IRA or a 401k, and you can continue to grow those funds, in let's say 10 years, you start withdrawing those funds, you'll be taxed on the growth as well as the contributions to that plan out of that retirement account on an annualized basis. Whereas when you have a steep correction, like what we just experienced in this uh, pandemic, this may be an opportune time to convert your retirement account to Roth IRA. To give you all an example, in March of 2009, we had the lowest point of the stock market. And we had a dozen of our clients that had large portfolios and retirement accounts convert to Roth IRAs. Because for a period of a, about a week, their, their portfolios dropped about 40 to 45%. And within 18 months, they recovered 100% of their funds. But now, since we converted to Roth during the lowest point in the marketplace, that growth is now all tax-free to those taxpayers. And since 2008 has been over 10 years ago now, actually over five years, some of these folks are now withdrawing those funds out of their retirement accounts on a tax-free annual basis. Wow. Well, yeah, it's very that's powerful. That's very helpful, very and helpful. All, and it's all about planning. So the key is to talk to your advisors like Chris. Chris is a great strategist for real estate. And it's really important if you're not sure about what to do next, to give Chris a call because Chris can advise you on your family's legacy and take it a step further from an estate planning perspective. Chris, are you involved often with your clients to discuss estate planning and planning their legacies for their families? More so from a cash flow perspective, uh, if it gets into the intricacies of the entities, of course not, we defer to somebody like Steven Spear. But uh, if, if we're talking about income, you know, seeing them through their later years and then what does that mean to the next generation behind them? Yeah, we, we, we walk them through that. Yeah, so as a result, um, I just had a call with an estate planning attorney earlier today and Steven Spearier is perfect for this webinar. Maybe we should do a three-way webinar with them about the specific topic. There, now is a great time to plan your estates for those of you that have estates over 10 million in value. And the reason why is the government has lowered their interest rates to the all-time low. And from an estate planning perspective, there's opportunity to shift assets from one generation to the next at a very, very low cost. And it's a great opportunity if you are comfortable with your portfolio and you don't plan on selling your portfolio, it's a great opportunity to plan your estate to the next level. And Chris German can help you with the valuation uh, piece of the equation of what your building may be worth to visit that as well as to have conversations about what next steps to take to plan for your family's future legacy. Now, there's plenty of people that are saying, look, at least given the evidence at hand, it looks as though apartment values are going to take a beating, right? Uh, if you have a situation where uh, a significant amount of the tenants are not paying rent, they have the cover fire from the government that also allows them not to be evicted. Unfortunately, some landlords can only sustain so long, may be motivated to sell, you get a couple, one, two, three fire sales. Now those sales comps uh, shape the market and it changes values just like we saw in 2008, nine and 10. So we, we've seen this movie prior. So for those who may contemplate a sale, what are the capital gains uh, rates at this point? Right now the capital gains rate, if the profit is under $1 million, it's 9.3% for California and it's up to 23.8% for the federal government. Now, if you have a sale that's over a million dollars, the California rate goes up to 13.3%. Is that just based upon sales price or you're talking about net proceeds? Let me rephrase the capital gains tax, not the sales price. So if your capital, okay. 
is over $1 million, the California rate will be as high as 13.3%. If the capital gain, your total income for the year is under $1 million, net income, meaning net profits from the sale of a building plus your other source of income, is under $1 million, then the California rate is 9.3%. For the federal government, it it's, goes no higher than 23.8%. And depreciation recapture, uh, how does one calculate what their liability is there? So let's talk about what depreciation is first for those of you that don't understand what that means. So if you buy a building, and let's say you put $100,000 into your building, the $100,000 improvement could be depreciated over time. The government gives you 27 years to depreciate that improvement, which is about 3% a year, 3 point, uh, let's call it, 3% for easy math. That 3% times $100,000, $3,000. Now, if you take that $3,000 and you depreciate that for 10 years, you have 3,000 a year times 10 years, that's $30,000. Now, let's say on the 10th year, you retain Chris to sell your building. And now you have to, the government will require you to pay back that $3,000 deduction you took every year over a 10 year period or $30,000 that $30,000 will be taxed at 25% to the federal government and 9.3% to the state of California if your total income for the state of California is, is under $1 million. So many are hearing, you know, as, as they tally thing, as you tally this up between the state capital gains tax rate, the federal uh, capital gains tax rate, depreciation recapture, and they're not excited about giving 35, 40, 45% to Uncle Sam. So they look to use a strategy uh, like private seller financing. They'll sell their asset, ask the buyer to say, put 30% down, carry the remaining 70%, say for a five year period or eight year period, what have you. How does the taxation work in that scenario for the seller? Again, you received, let's say it's a million dollar building and the buyer gives you 300,000 upfront, 700,000 will be paid in five years when the note, um, there's a balloon uh, on the note. In between for the five years, those monthly mortgage payments are interest only payments. How does the taxation work out for that? So when you sell or carry, the, you, you do what's called the profit percentage formula. So for example, if you bought a building for a million and you sell it for 2 million, that means you made a 50% profit on the sale of your building. So now let's say you, you collect a $100,000 down payment uh, on that building. That means 50% of that down payment will be subject to the capital gain tax rate of 23.8% for the federal government and 9.3% for California, plus the depreciation you've taken over the years. So let's say you've taken $100,000 worth of depreciation on that building. The government will want 25% for the depreciation plus 9.3% for the state of California for the depreciation. And then when you factor in the interest you receive on the income from carrying that note on an interest only basis, that interest will be subject to ordinary income rates depending upon how much interest you receive. Well, Steve, thank you. I know that the, our audience appreciates uh, your time. Um, I know you were eager to uh, get back in front of the camera because so much has developed since uh, it's funny we were together literally a month ago and uh, all this has developed into especially the cares act since then and i appreciate that you take this time for our uh, clients and, and investors who tune in uh, to essentially assist them i mean essentially they got a free consultation uh and and with our time and invested so so thank you steve you're welcome chris i'm happy to help your 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 landlords and your clients with this, uh, and, and don't be alone. I mean, the, the advice I can give everybody is don't be shy to, to raise your hand and ask questions. Nobody knows any of the answers. In case in point, Congress is changing the rules every day with the stimulus bill, and that gives you an idea that they don't even know the answer. So we all need to brainstorm together to find the best op, uh, optimum solution. Now, Steve has created uh, several entities, even just for my wife and myself, between our business, our rentals, our children. And that's at the onset of this interview, that's why I share that his, the depth of his knowledge goes far beyond just the tax code. 
So Steve, if individuals want to get in contact with you, seek your counsel, what's the best way to reach you? The best way to reach us is you call our office at 818-242-4888, or you can just simply text us, uh, which is the text is 38470. And you can text to RHA as the code, RHA. Uh, 38470 and after you complete your information you can plug in that you had, you saw this Chris German webinar and you have questions about your tax situation. Thank you sir thank you and I, I uh, hope that many of our viewers will take you up on your offer at least uh, to seek a second opinion get some assistance and uh, see just to see where their blind spots are maybe where the blind spots are that the CPA they're working with. Uh, Steve, until we talk again, I wish you well, sir. You and your family uh, stay safe. Make the best of the quarantine. Absolutely. Likewise. Stay healthy, everybody. Take care. Thank you for joining us once again. I hope that you find this informational content that we're sharing informative. It's helping you in these turbulent times to find firm footing. But if there's anything we haven't addressed, if there's an individual or a certain uh, profession that you would like us to interview, please share that in the comments below. It's based upon your feedback that we really uh, create the uh, next show that will we'll air. And so that you're not receiving the content in, on any sort of delay, please follow us on Facebook, like our Facebook page, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. This way you get the content as soon as it's released. And until uh, our next show, this is Chris German from The Apartment Dealer wishing you positive cash flow, tenants who behave, much protection from Uncle Sam, wishing you safety and all the best for you and your family as these are crazy times, but this too shall pass. Till next time.